The year is 1998. It's been 5 years since the original Doom has been released. The game had been skyrocketing in bestseller charts so far. People have been enjoying the very gory game, having fun shooting demons and cocking their double barrel shotguns. But little did they know that their little demon busting fantasy was about to come to an end and make room for other experiences. The original Half-Life was developed and published by a small team called Valve. Their vision of a first person shooter though was very different. Instead of appealing to a very cool and edgy image, their idea was to set the game in a very sciencey and nerdy setting. When players booted up this game for the first time, instead of waking up in a dungeon or a prison cell and being given a shotgun to say hello to the very first person out the door, this game had the players sit in a very cramped tram as it went through a sequence of factory workings while a very robotic voice briefed them on the game and its setting. This was very different because instead of giving the player a gun and setting the enemy bullet hell loose, the game focused on taking the story very seriously and entailed details with the story in mind. As a result, the game makes for a very weak first person shooter. But then, why did people like and gloat about this game so much if it was not comparable to the gory fun of Doom? Half-Life has a gameplay style of a first-person shooter mixed with puzzle elements and storytelling. The gameplay has these elements paced in different ways, with the beginning having more puzzle elements and the end having more combat encounters while sprinkling the story throughout the game. The game has a lot of different kind of enemies, from brutal soldiers to pesky ninjas and interdimensional aliens. The game also gives you many weird and wacky guns to combat them too which unlike so many games, ended up having each of those guns being useful. I cannot remember any of the weapons that I did not use throughout the game except for the two types of grenades. The main reason for this was that the game only gave you enough ammo to scrape by rather than loading you up to the brim. So as you can guess by that, the combat that we are given here is mainly defensive except for some exceptions. So if you decide to run and gun, you die against the soldiers, but it also had you keep you on your toes from the aliens or from the ninjas as being stationary means that they would flood your position. This was very new for the time compared to all the run and gun shooters out there. This approach let other elements than gameplay take the stage too which helped the game stand out more. One of the elements being the puzzle element. The puzzles here are not that hard but right enough to scratch your head, you know like any battle games. The game only required you to pay attention to the very few NPC dialogue the game had or the environment the player was in. But all of that still might not sound like something that would not go against the likes of crazy inducing style of Doom. What else are we missing here? Story and story elements of course. This game was one of the first games to emphasize story details into the gameplay. This game was the first game to introduce real-time cutscenes that the player could take part in rather than cutscenes that took control from the player away. The game also entails story details into the gameplay environment to also aid in the storytelling such as a soldier who supposedly arrived to rescue the staff shooting a scientist in front of you to imprint a message in you that they are not here to rescue you but to subdue all leaks about the experiment, including the scientists. Since I mentioned the story, I might as well talk about the plot and the setting. You play as Gordon Freeman, a PhD in theoretical science, working in the Black Mesa research facility, which involves in researching about classified and undocumented phenomena and materials. On the one fateful day that Dr. Freeman decided to board the tram and do an experiment with his fellow big brain small intuition scientist friends, they accidentally end up opening an interdimensional portal through which aliens invade the earth. While none of these elements on their own might seem impressive to you, the way the game intertwined them is where the magic comes. Remember how I told you that the combat is more on the defensive style? Why did they choose that style? 
It does not make sense when going up to games like Doom and Wolfenstein. Well, it's because of the story. Gordon Freeman is a trained scientist. Although one with intuition unlike his friends, he is still not a soldier. This is why instead of going Rambo style, Gordon knows his only chance to survive is through a defensive approach. To fit that narrative, Valve specifically decided to have the player not survive bullet storms like other games at the time. This form of storytelling was a new bookmark in gaming because it changed how games were structured. Half-Life had depth in its overall structure where the other linear games only had maybe one or two layers. While all of what it brought to the table was new, it did not invent all of that from some random interdimensional portal. All the elements it took were always there, like the very weird and different from each other style weapon roster to fun puzzles with extremely well-leveled designs and really well-made atmospheres. Half-Life's only genius was that it structured all those elements without making the game a clunky mess. While this game was innovative, it did not come with its own set of problems. Things like the Halo franchise, less boomer shooters, and WoW's apparent inability to make a very satisfying boss fight. Yes, while this game is just overall great, this is the one aspect where the game just downright sucks. All the four boss fights you have are mediocre at best, except for when you encounter the Gargantua. But even then, the fight I had with the Gargancho on the later stage was also not that great. Not to forget, for me, the Gargancho boss fight was pretty easy since for this playthrough, they both were broken. As in the first encounter, the soldier who was meant to die kept the thing engaged while I did the things to start the tram instead of it chasing me. The second part of the fight in the later chapter was also broken since the entrance door did not break for some odd reason. So I just stood there while I patiently aligned the nuke onto its position. But the most egregious and frustrating boss fight was the Nihilanth, the last boss fight. That thing had the worst roster of attacks, ranging from a high damage zapping ball to a player seeking portal that just puts you into rooms where you had a ton of enemies stuffed in them. This might not be the worst until you realize that to defeat the thing, you need to shoot a couple of crystals which are super high and on top of that lobe a grenade into its head without it bouncing off of it. Oh, also, did I mention that if you get too close to this thing it one shots you? Thank god for the quick save and quick load function cause if not for those, I would have been done with this. Seriously, it took me 3 days, 3 full days to beat that thing. It's mainly the reason why this video is delayed so far. The other gripe that me and most people agree about though are the three final chapters in Zen. Seriously, Zen was a mistake, just like an unplanned pregnancy. The worst of those three chapters are Interloper and Nihilant. Chapter Zen was cool because the game was building it up to it and seeing the place where the aliens came from was the payoff. And it was definitely cool to see the very different and alien atmosphere of you don't belong here. But then they put you into the middle of an alien infested colony where you get barely any ammo and you die each second. I get that they were hammering down the atmosphere of you don't belong here, but it seems like Valve did not know about the concept of overdoing things. Until then, I preferred the alien encounters because they were not as brutal and unfair as the soldier encounters were and you got the sweet mix of combat with puzzle and story. But in the chapter Interloper, it was always unfair plus no more cover. The icing on top of this all was a very cryptic ending. Xen also introduced the most underutilized mechanic of the clunky long jump. So if you're one of those people who says Sen was the best and more of Half-Life Xen, please. Well, just know that Xen was an unplanned mistake, just like you. Regardless of the major one or two mistakes the game has, 
The game otherwise is a very good game that still stands the test of time compared to some other games before 1998. That is, of course, with the graphics mod. The footage that you see is not the native Half-Life 1. It actually has HD textures using the Xash 3D engine, which is how I played the game on my FHD monitor. You can also play this game on mobile by downloading Sash 3D Engine from the Play Store and using a controller, but I would not recommend that as it was clunky as hell the first time I tried it. Obviously, I never reached the end in the mobile version, but I can only imagine broken screens if I were to ever make it to send. But it is still crazy that what was once the pinnacle of graphics fidelity is capable of running on your smartphone natively. Half-Life was an innovative piece of game that played a major role in turning gaming industry standards to what it is today. While we might have lost a couple of franchises due to this turn, we got so many more innovative franchises that all did something differently. Whenever you play this game, this game feels like it was released in 2001 to 2003. That itself tells you that it already was ahead of its time back in 1998. While personally, I don't have much investment in the Half-Life franchise, with my first Half-Life experience being the one on the smartphone, it was great experiencing what was essentially a bookmark in gaming history and to be able to see the forefather of modern games. <laughs>